marhaban wa ahlan bakum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum, Robert Satloff. Benispa lemorasha hay el riasa, yasab el tachalos min bad el takalid. Takbil al atfal, wa ziarat al mohar janat el reifia. Wal jolat el intahabia min al araba el khalfia, le katar yatawakaf hasab el tolob. Wa jama'a el tabarayat min khalal el mukalamat hatafia, fi wakt mutaakhir min al lail illa milionarat katumin. Wa dauna la nansa el rikla el saria, illa el kharij le morashach el tabahi be marafatihi be shu'un el alim. Adatan ma yakun delika kul el ikhtimam el adhi takhda bihi el siyas el kharajia. خلال حملة انتخابات رئاسية، ولكن هذا الأم قد يكون مختلفاً، ففي النهاية لدينا سيدم غير مرتاد هذا الأم. من ناحية يرشح الديمقراطيون مرشحة تأمل أن تكون أول وزيرة خارجية سابقة تتولى الرئاسة منذ الحرب الأهلية قبل أكثر من 150 أماً. من ناحية أخرى يرشح الجمهوريون شخصاً خبرته بالسياسة الخارجية أكثر من أي مرشح في الأزمنة الحديثة. كيف من المرشح أن تبرز السياسة الخارجية كموضوع في منافسة على الرئاسة خلال هذا السيف؟ هل سيلتزم المرشح بالتكاليد ويسافر إلى الخارج؟ كيف قد تؤثر أحداث غير متوقعة على السباك من أجل البيت الأبيض؟ لمناقشة هذه الأسئلة المهمة يسرني أن أراهب بلجنتنا التي تدم خبيري السياسة الخارجية دينيس روس ووان زراتي. Welcome to Dakel Washington. Today we're going to discuss the role of foreign policy in our presidential campaign. I'm delighted to have our panel of foreign policy experts here. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. So you have both been through numerous campaigns. How important do you think this campaign will make the issue of foreign policy? Dennis? You know, my instinct is to say that foreign policy will be there simply because the issue of terror is, is prominent and there's a, an acute awareness of that. But it's also pretty clear that we've seen a campaign where someone like Trump could emerge, where Sanders was a formidable candidate, and their focus was really not on foreign policy. Their focus was very much on what's going on here, uh, you know, how, how you deal with what is the, I think, the, a lot of the anger, the alienation that at least a segment of the population feels, and that's very much uh, domestically driven. So I think that foreign policy will be an element of it, uh, and I suspect that in the case of Hillary Clinton, she will want to play it up some because she's going to want to create an image that Trump is simply not someone who can be trusted to be in the Oval Office given the decisions you make that are related to war and peace. But I still think that that's going to be more a subtext in this election rather than the, the guiding spirit of it. Mm -hmm. Juan? I, I think Dennis is right. I, I look at it in three ways. One is there's the, the occasion of international incidents that come to the fore that are, are obviously in the news, a terrorist incident, war, uh, the, the United Kingdom pulling out of the European Union, these kinds of big international events that naturally play into any sort of presidential campaign. So that will happen, no doubt. Second, you have the fact that there are fundamental questions as to what's happening in the world, the sense of international dislocation, and a very real and important question as to what America's role in the world should be with the rise of China, uh, the war in Syria, and all of the problems that are in the, the headlines consistently. And so a, a broader question that really is, is at play. And then perhaps most tactically and, and perhaps importantly politically is um, these are issues that, that can be used for political tactics. Uh, Donald Trump will criticize, as he already has, uh, Secretary Clinton for all the past mistakes uh, that he lays at her feet, uh, given her role as Secretary of State. Uh, she was in charge of foreign policy during a good chunk of the Obama administration. And she likewise will 
point out, as Dennis uh, mentioned, the fact that this is a man with no foreign policy experience and what seems to be a rather incoherent narrative as to what he will do as president. And so those are kind of the, the ways I think foreign policy plays in. But ultimately, I think Dennis is right, this will play off of American sentiment and issues uh, largely here at home. I want to ask you about one of your points, and you mentioned it as well, Dennis. Even, we have this year the greatest contrast perhaps in American history in terms of experience in foreign policy. But I, I think a case could be made that Donald Trump makes more of a focus on foreign policy in this campaign than Hillary Clinton. What do you think? I think that's right, in part because she did play a role as Secretary of State. There is this sense of international dislocation. There's a sense that the world that President Obama is handing to his successor is actually in worse shape than it was before, at least the, the, the argument can be made. Um, and Secretary Clinton has, uh, as a candidate, tied herself very neatly to the Obama administration. She has not gone out of her way to distinguish her, her policies or foreign policy from that of the Obama administration. So any criticism that can be made against the Obama foreign policy, the American posture in the world, the sense of American absence in places like the Middle East um, are key themes that Donald Trump has already keyed on and will continue to hammer home uh, to great effect. Her argument is, is more about experience and judgment um, but that doesn't play or resonate quite as well, and especially when there are problems like Syria and Libya that she did play a hand in, that's a harder argument for her to make. Yeah, I, th I think that there's a reality here that Trump will try to do that, but I think Trump is gonna go after her as much as, if not more, on the fact that I'm a guy who built businesses, I know how to fix the economy, I know how to make America great again, the whole theme of America first, it's really, it's a far less about foreign policy. It's much more about what he's going to do here at home. She will come at, at him in terms of having a kind of uh, intemperate personality, a kind of impulsive approach to things, someone who you can't trust to make, uh, in a sense, careful decisions. And so I think, I do think foreign policy is an element here, but I think it ultimately will be more of a vulnerability for him because also he knows so little about it. I mean, every time he speaks about it, it's pretty clear that there isn't a strong knowledge base there. And you can imagine in the debates, first of all, there'll undoubtedly be a debate that is devoted to foreign policy. Uh, and he'll study up, but she is, you know, she will look for openings to show what he doesn't know. So we have historically had these sorts of um, uh, clashes over time, not perhaps to the extent that we have today. And they've tended to come down to a debate over competence versus ideology, right. um, um, who is uh, uh, um, smarter and more experienced versus who thinks about the world right. in a certain way. How do you put that frame in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this current campaign? Well, it's a, it's, it's a good one. Look, you can, you can hearken back to Reagan Carter. Uh, and you know, there will be many people who will say, well, many people underestimated Reagan as well. Uh, the difference is Reagan had a different kind of personality. Than Trump. Yes, I mean, Reagan's personality, and this is actually what made it very difficult for Carter to portray him as someone who couldn't handle the responsibilities or who was going to be, you know, who was going to make these extreme decisions. You know, the, the whole image uh, of Reagan was, in a sense, that there was a warmth to him, there was a kindliness to him, there wasn't a belligerence to him. Uh, and, and with Trump, it's very much the, the opposite. So I, I do think that this, I think it's a fair frame. And I do think you're going to see a kind of ideology versus competence. But I think it, it becomes, in Trump's case, there's a burden on him to prove that, in fact, he's the kind of, he's the kind of person who can be thoughtful in office. Every time he says, you'll see how presidential I'll become, you, you, you won't believe how presidential I'll become. <laughs> and then, you know, it takes 15 minutes before we've seen him revert to form. So I really think that there, you know, the, the challenge for him is to prove that in fact, he can, he can convey an image of thoughtfulness and care. And, and I think that's right. The other thing that Reagan brought with him was that he had governed uh, at right. least a, a major state. Right. Um, understood how politics worked in Washington, had advisors around him. I think 
One of the deficits that the Trump campaign is already suffering from is not having a trusted set of uh, well understood, respected uh, advisors that you could say, look, you may not think that he's as experienced, but he, he can run this like a CEO would. He can bring in very senior, trusted individuals with gravitas who will advise him and uh, who will steer the ship of our foreign policy in a, in a thoughtful uh, way uh, and give it a, a narrative. Uh, because I think the second problem with the Trump uh, campaign uh, to your point about ideology is it's not clear at all what the guiding principles of the foreign policy should be. Now, one could argue maybe that's not what we need. We need a, 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 a president and a foreign policy that is a bit, a, a bit more fluid, less principle-centered. I don't agree with that, but at a minimum you have to kind of understand where the president wants to take America in the world. And I think he struggles with at one point being about uh, ferocious American leadership and intervention, at the same time, fierce withdrawal uh, from the world. And, and, uh, and this notion of building walls and et cetera sort of uh, is a core part of his campaign. Uh, Secretary Clinton, interestingly, plays more of the role of the establishment foreign policy figure, uh, one that's more understandable, even attractive to some Republicans. For example, former uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, Rich Armitage, who's already said, uh, he would support a Republican who will already support uh, Secretary Clinton. Yeah, so, Brent Scowcroft and Brent Scowcroft and others. So, um, she plays the more conventional role, which, from a foreign policy perspective, is good. From a domestic political perspective, plays into the notion that she's part of the establishment. Something that Trump will hit very hard. You just, I do think there is uh, uh, again the contrast with Reagan. I think is worth noting, and I think Juan, the point you made here is important. Reagan had a view of the world. And he was able to articulate that view of the world. And Trump doesn't have a view of the world because there's this kind of, there, this America first notion, uh, apart from the fact that it harkens back to the 1930s. The fact is there isn't a consistency to it. His approach to alliances, well, you know, Japan and South Korea, if they don't pay more, let them go their own way and have nuclear weapons. NATO, do we really need NATO? I mean, this is not someone who in a sense when he talks about being engaged in the world, it looks to be engaged almost unilaterally. Uh, and so I think, unlike a Reagan who had a view about how to reassert American power, but in a way that was believable, there was a consistency to it. For Trump, again, Trump is going to need to either create more of a consistent narrative and or he's going to need to have some people around him who are seen as being highly credible uh, in international relations. And right now we don't see that, but that could come. Okay, we're gonna come back to just that question in a minute with more on foreign policy in our presidential election with our panel of foreign policy experts. Advisors. We've just seen a, a fascinating example in Britain of the British people by a substantial majority, not just voting to leave the European Union, but basically saying, go to hell to all of the experts, um, uh, pundits, uh, brilliant minds who warned against this. What does that say about our politics and perhaps the fact that Donald Trump doesn't have any advisors? Is this bad or is this politically wise? Well, it may reflect that the mood and the temper of the times. I mean, there, there is no question, a kind of dislocation that's been created by globalization. There's a kind of fear over status. There's a, a, a part of certainly uh, the people in, in the UK and within our own country who feel threatened by some of the new economic trends, who feel threatened by the changing face of America. Uh, you know, they, they feel unsettled and they see the the elites and the, and the experts being, in a sense, very distant from their concerns. And someone who can capture that, someone who can put into words what they're feeling and seems to represent that and is prepared to challenge the elites, is bound to get support from them. And that helps to explain at least why we've seen not only the support that Trump had, but also the support that Sanders had. And it also helps to explain what you've seen uh, in the UK where immigration was, I think, one of the perhaps overriding issues that affected this vote. 
it's really interesting to look at the breakdown of the vote in terms of the big cities versus the countryside, look at the demographic differences, the, the young voted to stay in, the old who felt more threatened by this voted to, to, uh, to get out. So you're seeing, I think, people voting more their fears than their hopes uh, and being governed largely by their fears. And there is an element certainly of that here. And you, know, you can't dismiss those fears. Obviously, they exist. And there is some reason for them to have it. What is required for those who represent the more establishment of the elite, they've got to show a recognition of what's driving those fears. And they have to come up with prescriptions for how to respond to it in a way that is credible. Dennis's point about the demographics is really interesting and important. And if you translate that into the American context, what's important to realize is that both in the Democratic and Republican uh, primary uh, campaigns, you've seen this swell of sentiment against the establishment, against the sense of crony capitalism and politics and the blend of that, and uh, sort of the, the citadel of expert bureaucracy, which is something that certainly played a role in the UK Brexit debate. Um, but I think one interesting question for uh, Trump, who's tried to capture this mood most aggressively, is whether or not he can capture that percentage of the population that may feel disaffected, but may also be worried uh, that you don't want a neophyte or a, 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 a president who has very little mooring and, and expertise as a president sort of taking office. And, so I don't know what the numbers look like in that regard. There's certainly that mood, but there is a percentage likely that are looking for a candidate that can capture that theme, but also demonstrate he can be responsible in governing to actually deliver on promises of greater equality, uh, social justice, uh, and, and, and a greater sense of social mobility. Um, if so far, he hasn't demonstrated that, and I think that's where advisors come into play. Just one point, Rob, on the foreign policy side, I think he could do himself a lot of uh, good by bringing in advisors. I can imagine uh, Ambassador Zal Khalizay, for example, bringing him in, yeah. breaking the, the notion that uh, there's any problem with Muslim Americans in his campaign, the senior most American diplomat uh, uh, who's Muslim American, and say, look, he's my presumptive Secretary of State. I mean, that would be a powerful message. It would give a sense of gravitas. It would change the conversation a bit. Even something like that would not force him to abandon his notion that he's anti-establishment, but it would demonstrate that he could be responsible in steering the state. Now, you both worked for uh, presidents who came to office with virtually no foreign policy credentials. George W. Bush, governor of Texas, Bill Clinton, governor of Arkansas, not known for, uh, for being uh, major players on the world stage. Um, I think both of them did the summer tour abroad during their presidential campaigns, rub shoulders with some foreign leaders. Will any of that work for Trump? Will, or will he have some other strategy to try to address this? Or maybe, in his view, it doesn't need addressing. What do you think? Uh, it's <laughs> hard to know what's in his mind, of course. But I, I think he sees himself as a as a world figure, right, with his name uh, emblazoned on buildings around the world, his business interests uh, throughout the world. And so in some way, I don't think he necessarily sees uh, the need to demonstrate that he is worldly or has experience, even though, as we're arguing he here, there is a real need for that. Um, so I don't anticipate, uh, like we saw with, with candidate Obama, uh, a, a major speech in Berlin to, to demonstrate credibility abroad. Uh, he is uh, going to places like Scotland, his, where his forefathers came from, and things like that. But I don't anticipate that Trump will ac actually see as essential uh, trying to convince people that he knows uh, world capitals. Instead, he's probably going to visit key states where he needs those votes. Yeah, I, I think one of the things we've seen with Trump is that he thinks he's his own best advisor. Uh, and it worked for him during the primaries. The question will be whether it works for him in the general election. The two of us are suggesting it probably will not work for him in the general election. And we'll have to see whether he evolves and takes account of that. I mean, someone who is a successful businessman presumably knows when to cut his losses. Obviously, if you look at his career, he's done that many times. <laughs> so. Presumably, at some point, he recognizes that he needs something like that. I mean, 
it seems to me that he would need someone who is seen as a very serious, thoughtful, solid kind of figure, especially in the national security area. I mean, I think that's where he has a vulnerability. Uh, and even though I still believe that the economy and domestic issues are still going to be the main theme, the subtext remains an important element. And ultimately, people have to have a comfort level. I think his biggest problem is not just his high negatives, but the high negatives also reflect a kind of deep unease with him. So unless he can address that, it's very hard to see how he can be successful. Okay. Will uh, Donald Trump go on the offensive on foreign policy? Will Hillary Clinton separate herself from the president? We will see in the weeks ahead. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on Dachl Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Inside Washington at Elhura.com. Makum Robert Satloff. Shukran lakum wa ila lakah.